Welcome everyone to today's devotion. We find ourselves in Ephesians chapter 2, which puts us about a third of the way through the book. I think a lot of people will be surprised to find just how short um, much of the New Testament is. Ephesians is only six chapters, which means uh, by the end of tomorrow, um, we'll be halfway through this book already. Uh, so, so not only have we finished Romans, but we're, we will be uh, halfway through Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 2 is one of the better known passages in the book of Ephesians, particularly because of the first 10 verses. The first 10 verses is perhaps the best layout um, briefly written uh, on the gospel message. Uh, here, Paul lays out uh, every aspect of what it means to be a Christian and what it means to be saved, uh, and that is sin um, and, and the cross resurrection of, of Jesus. It's it's, it's all right here. And so if you wanted to point someone or even yourself to a single passage that lays out the gospel um, just very succinctly, this would be the place. Although we saw in Romans that Paul walks us through slowly through an understanding of the gospel, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 and 10 uh, lays it out uh, in a very clear and precise way uh, that is much briefer than, than what we got in, in Romans. So notice that he begins with the issue of sin. Now you, you can't get the good news without the bad news. And the bad news is, as he says in verse 1, we were dead in our trespasses and sins. Now we, we need to pause there and realize uh, that, that the word dead only has one definition. Right? You, one, just as one can't be a little pregnant, you can't be a little dead. Right? Uh, dead. Sin uh, has made us dead in Christ. We, 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 we are, uh, I'm sorry, not dead in Christ, but we, we are dead in our sins. We are dead, just dead. So, so everything we do, the works and, and, and our flesh and, and our desires, all of that is just dead works. So any notion that one can just be a good person and, and uh, when, we, when we get to before God on Judgment Day, um, we, we, we can say, look, see, see what a good person I was. And God will say, you, all of that is dead. You, you, you are dead in your trespasses and sins, which means the answer to the, the human's problem is not uh, good advice. It has to be good news. It has to be a message of resurrection. What we need is to be raised. What we need is to be given a new identity. What we need is a Savior. Um, and you'll notice that not only are we dead in our trespasses and sins, but we walk following the course of this world, which is ironic, right? Uh, perhaps he's mixing metaphors. Not only are we dead, but we're also we walk. So uh, for you zombie fans, why are you a zombie fan? But nevertheless, we, we, we see here that, that we're dead spiritually, yet we walk in our deadness. Um, and this, this only condemns us. Why? Because we take the, our very nature and we, we, we apply it to our lives and to our communities and our families. And so when you have uh, lost people and a lost uh, uh, worship, uh, what you get is, well, if you turn on the news lately, uh, a, 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 a uh, devolving culture in a, in a family that, that is starting to fall apart. Um, and so he goes on and says that we lived according to the passions of our flesh there verse 3 we carry out the desires of the body and the mind it's interesting he closes both body and mind and we were he says by nature children of wrath so, so we are our nature is the problem which is striking because we live in a culture that because we worship materialism we're, 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 materialism is the worldview of the day the nature is is our primary means of more of morality that is to say that if it feels good do it if if you see it in nature it must be moral so we'll say things like i was born this way i gotta follow my heart this is just who i am um so on and, and so forth right and, and here paul says the opposite he says oh your nature is is subject to god's wrath I mean, if all of us did whatever it is that we want, or as the Bible puts it, we do what is right in our own eyes, what you have then is anarchy, which is what you're having right now if you turn on your news. Anarchy. We are, by nature, children of wrath. But the good news starts in verse 4. Charles Spurgeon did an entire sermon on the first two words of verse 4, but God. 
So, so you really need to pause there and say that if for, first three verses are true, and they are, then what does that mean for, for me as an individual, but us as a society? What you get is an unraveling of society, a breakdown of the family, and a destruction of the self. Well, of course, because when we are handed over, remember Romans 1, whenever we are handed over to our sin, what you get is destruction and chaos. The good news of Jesus is God enters into that chaos. And out of chaos, God brings order. So yes, we have sin and we have destruction and we have shame. We have all of that. But God, being rich in mercy... Because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, even we, when we were uh, by nature children of wrath, he made us alive together in Christ. So notice this is both uh, individually true, it's also true for, for, for our community, that, that is the, the, the church. So, so he says that even though we are on a path of destruction, God in his rich mercy and love stepped into our story, walked among us, was one of us, became as one of us, and, and suffered under the evil that is humanity. The incarnation of Jesus is unique in re religious history. All other religions says, sure, you're a bad person, but if you work hard enough, you can be a good person. But only in the gospel do we have where God himself comes down to rescue. So every religion is about us reaching up to God, but in Christianity it's about God reaching down for us, becoming one of us in order to, to save us. And so God's motive here is his rich mercy and his lavish love who makes us alive. We were dead, now we're alive. Hopefully you can already see the gospel story in the gospel message. The gospel story is Jesus comes down, he lives a perfect life, he suffers under the sins of men, and though dies, is raised again. So too, what is the gospel message? God has come down to rescue us, that though we are dead, he makes us alive in Christ. How does he do this? Well, at the end of verse 5, going on to verse 6 and following, explains that by grace you have been saved. Not of your good works, not of your good looks, not of your good genes. It is by grace, solely by grace, God's unmerited favor, we are saved. In verse 6, he raised us up with him. There is the message of the resurrection. As Christ was raised, we will be raised, we are raised. So I am not who I once was. Remember the image of baptism that we talked about in Romans 6. The, the image of baptism is objective and subjective. Objective is Jesus died, was buried, and raised again. Subjectively is who stands before you is an old man who has died. He has been buried and washed, and who stands before you is a new creature in Christ, a new man. And in a culture that, that is shaped by Eastern shame culture, you can call it woke religion, you can call it cancel culture, it's nothing more than Eastern shame culture. What we need, and in shame culture, you don't get forgiveness. You don't get second chances. You, you don't get the benefit of the doubt. You wrote that tweet uh, 10 years ago, then, then you are ostracized. You're outside the camp. You are a leper. You're unclean now. Doesn't matter how rich and powerful you are. Doesn't matter how little you are. Doesn't matter your, 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 your anything. If you're a victim status, whatever. It doesn't matter. Shame. Shame culture. It's cancel culture. Woke religion. The gospel comes and says that you can be made a new person, no longer defined by your past, no longer defined by your mistakes, no longer defined what others think of you, but defined by who God says you are. You are ra risen with him in Christ. Go back to Ephesians 1 for more of that. So verse 8 and 9 is the, the two verses that um, you, you, you may even have memorized. Hopefully you do. Uh, for by grace you've been saved through faith. This is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God, not of a result of work, so that no one may boast. So notice that by grace you are saved through faith. So what is it that we do to receive the rich mercy and the lavish love of God? Believe. And that is the basis by which the grace of God comes and saves. 
It isn't, as Paul says, of our own doing. It's a gift. It's not only the result of works, lest we boast. See the parallelism. It's not of what we do. It's not of works, but rather it is a gift, therefore we cannot boast. When and I think I've shared this on a lot of versions before, but, but, but when my wife and I first got married, literally nothing we owned we had bought. Uh, we, we were we were dirt poor. Like like maybe a little below dirt poor. I mean we 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 we, we would just to have any money and I was making maybe hundred fifty dollars a week in retail, not for brag. I was making about a hundred dollars in ministry. Um, and I was great for all of that. Amanda was making you know, two to three hundred dollars in her 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 full time uh, actually probably not even that when we first got married. She was still at Lobby Hobby. Um, and, and we were barely making ends meet. And that meant that just simple things, from silverware to plates to, to, to the uh, uh, covers on our bed, to, to do everything. When we walked into that apartment as a married couple, I don't think we had actually bought anything. I mean, from, from our bed and its mattress to, to our couch to, to, to our TVs. We, you know, we brought a lot of things in from high school and college and stuff. But, but I heard before for, for the wedding um, uh, uh, showers, I mean, we, we wouldn't have anything. We couldn't function as a couple, which meant we had no reason when people came over to brag about our stuff. But what we could say is um, um, this entertainment center, this nice desk, this coffee table, this table, this everything is a result of the generosity of, of people who love us. We had nothing to brag about what we owned, but we could brag about the generosity of others. These were all gifts. So too, when we think of the gospel, it shouldn't conjure up pride, because I'm a Christian, I've got everything figured out. But rather humility in the sense that I've come to Christ and I realize I had nothing figured out. What a gift I've been given. May we make much of Jesus and less of ourselves. And the Christian life is summarized in verse 10. We are his workmanship, created in Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we shall walk in them. Now, now notice the, the, the inclusio here. We, we begin with, you walked in your deadness, but now you walk in your aliveness. You have to ask uh, Merriam-Webster if that is a real word or not. If not, I made it up. And don't judge me, you bigot. So, so we, we walk now in our, in, in, in our life. We, we walk now in, in Christ. And notice that good works are the result of the gospel, not, not in order to receive the gospel. Who I am is because of Jesus. So works follows faith. It doesn't precede faith. Well, that's the clear gospel laid out. We are sinners. Jesus has entered into our story to save us. And upon faith and repentance, we, we, we receive the gospel. And now, as believers, we go and follow Jesus. That is the gospel message in a nutshell. Now, what he does starting in verse 11 is he begins to articulate a major theme in Ephesians. And that is that of unity. And that in order to understand this, the gospel stands at the center. Because where there is sin, there is division. There is chaos. There is disorder. Where there is gospel, there is unity. There is peace. There is reconciliation. If you want to understand our world, it's not more complicated than that. And we can talk about woke religion, we can talk about materialism, we can talk about the effects of Darwinism, we can talk about the rise of secularism, we can talk about uh, identity politics, all of those things are helpful. I would add to that the polytheistic culture in which we live in, we worship multiple gods and none of them saved. Yet at its core, it's quite simple. You want to explain why our world is a mess? Where there is sin, especially when you normalize sin, you celebrate sin and eventually legalize sin, what you get out of that is disorder, chaos, and madness. When you have the gospel and a group of people believe the gospel, are shaped by the gospel, what you get is unity and reconciliation, which means all of this protesting and fighting over race or gender or uh, my personal preferences will only lead to more disorder. It will only lead to more uh, division. Until we take the gospel seriously, will this culture and this country ever heal? I can prove it to you from this text. 
Notice what, what Paul does here. He looks at the Gentiles in this community. It's a predominantly Gentile church, whereas the Romans, he had to deal with both Jews and Gentiles. This is a predominantly Gentile church, from what we can tell. And he says there, to you Gentiles, remember you were Gentiles in the flesh. Now notice Paul has already hinted at where he's going at here. He says, culturally speaking, to other people, you are Gentile, and there's nothing else about you. You are a Gentile. Therefore, their opinion of you is shaped by that. What they think of you is shaped by that. Your future is shaped by that. Your, 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 your standing in a culture is shaped by that. You are this. And we've stamped you as Gentile. Now, we don't use the word Gentile now. What we'll say is, you are this race, you are this gender, you are this politics, you are this, you are that. And whatever label you are given, that is who you are. We don't care about your personality. We don't care about your upbringing. We don't care about your, your, your understanding of truth and value and morality. We don't care about any of that stuff. What we care about is you are this, therefore you are that. We don't get any deeper than that. And Paul says to many of you, in the eyes of the culture, you are a Gentile according to the flesh. You are nothing more than that. Remember those days, Paul says? You can already see where he's going at. And, and, and he's saying that from the Jew's perspective, you're nothing more than a Gentile. You're outside of the camp. You were called the uncircumcised, he, he says there, uh, by, by the Jews. Um, and, and he says, as a result of that, you were separated from Christ. You were separated from, from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers that come to the problem. Uh, promises. And we talked a lot about that in, 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 in the book of Romans. And Paul says, look, from the Jewish perspective, who, who whom Jesus uh, 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 was in, incarnated among them and, and salvation was first brought to them, to those first believers, you were a Gentile and you'll, you'll, you'll never find salvation. There's no hope for you because of how they viewed you racially. Et, et, uh, et, now I can't talk. But, but, but everything about you is, is unworthy of Christ, unworthy of salvation, unworthy of change, unworthy of anything because of a label that's been put on you. This is who you are. But then notice what Paul says, verse 13. But now in Christ Jesus, see the language. Remember, verse 4 was, but God, which changed everything. Now, verse 13, but now in Christ Jesus, which changes everything. You who were once far off, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace who has made us both one and has broken down in the flesh the dividing wall of hostility. Did you see what Paul just did there? You want to talk about reconciliation. You want to talk about racial reconciliation. You want to talk about peace in our times. The answer is found right here. Paul recognizes every culture does this. We determine who a person is. We judge who they are by race, gender, socioeconomics, politics, Whatever it might be, we say, you are that and nothing more. But Paul says, from the Jewish perspective, that's who you were. And by the way, from the Gentile perspective, that's what they did to the Jews. You see, but when Christ entered into our world, what happened? He broke down man-made barriers, man-made definitions. And he says, I will bring two who were divided and reconcile them in Christ. You were redeemed. Not by your politics, not by your, your, your entertainment, not by the false idols of our age, but by the blood of Jesus. Jew or Gentile, male or female, black or white, slave, free, Roman, Jew. This stuff doesn't matter in Christ. Why? Because he's the Lord and Savior and creator of all. Not just of the household of Israel. And not just whoever is winning in the polls. Therefore, he reconciles us to see not my race, not my gender, not my preferences, not my politics, but the blood of Jesus. That brings peace. Verse 17. He came and preached peace to you who were far off and 
peace to those who were near. These two groups. For through him we have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you're no longer strangers and aliens, but you're fellow citizens of the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple to the Lord. In him, same language from chapter 1, you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. What we see here is the beauty of the church that is made clear in Revelation where we see people of every tribe, language, tongue, people group, um, uh, status, whatever, are all together with one voice glorifying the God, their creator, redeemer. Revelation 4 and 5 lays this out very clearly, as does other parts of Revelation. That is Paul's goal here. Stop seeing yourself as Jew or Gentile. Stop seeing yourself as male and female. Stop seeing yourself as Republican Democrat. Stop seeing yourself as Libertarian and Marxist. Stop seeing yourself as black and white. Stop seeing yourself as, 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 as immigrant and citizen. Stop seeing yourself in these ways and see yourself in the peace that God brings in reconciling us through the gospel of Christ. That's the hope we have. Not this nonsense we have in our streets right now or among our statesmen right now. The hope we have is Jesus. May we soon believe it. But it will begin when you believe it and you live it. It's got to start in our churches. Lord willing, we'll see you guys here tomorrow. Look at Ephesians 3.